listening to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to take a look at something that's of an awful lot of interest to myself, and personally here. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've always been fascinated with the topic of electrogravitics. So tonight, we're going to take a look at the lost notes of one... Dr. T. Townsend Brown, the real Doc Brown, if you will. And these notes have only just recently come to public attention from Dr. Brown's personal collection. These were his personal notes from his personal notebook regarding the structure of space. So this is interesting, and you have to remember Dr. Brown was an experimental scientist and a physicist. He worked on top-secret military projects. He was involved in the Philadelphia Experiment. He was involved in many other things with the Naval Department. And he also is credited with discovering what's called the Byfield-Brown Effect. This is a strange phenomenon wherein... Movement or motion is able to be produced, thrust is able to be produced by charging an electrical capacitor plate in a certain way. Now, he discovered this in the 1920s as a very young man working under his mentor, Dr. Byfield. And this phenomenon has been studied since then. And Brown went quite a distance with this effect that he was able to reproduce over and over again and was able to produce some really interesting technologies based on it. But then in the 1950s, when it was brought to the attention of the military-industrial complex, he stepped away from it. He backed off on his push of this effect and tried to relegate it to basically being little more than something comparable to what the they now refer to as ion wind, which doesn't explain the full scope of the phenomenon. But he backed away from it because he found within the Naval Department, whom he presented this to, he had discovered there were infiltrators from the intelligence community from other countries, and he thought it best to step away from this research for a time and try to discredit his own research, knowing full well that there was something to this. But in secret, behind the scenes, he continued to explore these different facets of thought, and there were others within the military-industrial complex that pursued these technologies, in my estimation. This is what we're talking about, anti-gravity craft. Anti-gravity propulsion systems. Not only that, communication systems that go way beyond what we would think about or know about today. Instantaneous communication. Now, how communication normally works in the standard radio broadcast industry is these waveforms travel at roughly the speed of light to where they're going, and sometimes you have distortion and sometimes you have interference and these kind of things in the waveform pattern. And it takes time. There's this time scale introduced in the sending and receiving of messages. Well, Dr. Brown's technology found a way to bypass that very state. And what we're referring to here is what is now known by people who study these things as scalar wave technology. It's a longitudinal wave. And he discovered and patented some communication devices with this and various other devices too. And I earnestly believe that... Certain corporations within the military-industrial complex under the auspices and guise of special access programs have developed more of these technologies than what we are aware of today. Not just the communications ones, but the ones that are also known as electrogravitics or gravity control, anti-gravity devices, anti-gravity spacecraft, if you want to call them that. 
Do they really go to space, though? That's the other question. <laughs> if they even exist at all. But I, I've seen the evidence that seems to demonstrate that there's something to this, and it ties directly to the UFO phenomenon as well. And another little-known fact about Dr. Brown, T. Townsend Brown, was also one of the founding members of NICAP, that UFO organization, an early UFO organization founded in the 1950s as a response to these flying saucer phenomena that were observed then. So he was heavily interested in the UFO phenomenon. And in my view, I think he largely is the person we should credit with the invention of UFO craft of sorts here on Earth. These things that we would identify as the, the classical flying saucer, the anti-gravity aircraft. The uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon that they call it now, the UAP. Not the UFO anymore, they've rebranded. And this is actually the original name Dr. Brown came up with for it. The UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. So, that being the case, there's a lot of interesting connections and ties here. But tonight, we're going to go through his notes regarding what he calls the structure of space. Now, keep in mind, he comes at this because he was around and learning the game of physics at the time when Einstein's theories were being heavily promoted and they were the newest thing, the biggest thing, and they revolutionized the way people think about the world. So this was in the beginning phases of what we would call the modern physics era, where we have the relativity physics, Einstein's relativistic ways of thinking in the terms of physics. So he this was being applied, and at the same time they were coming up with all of these quantum ideas as well, the precursors of many of these. So he was looking at it through this classical type of a lens, this one we're given now, of what we accept in modern physics as modern physics. But this was also at the end of an era when ether physics was an accepted thing. And this was largely discredited at that point in the mainstream, with the work of Einstein being pushed and promoted. So he comes at it through this lens of observation, where he's looking at it in terms of the more modern physics theories, the Einsteinian type theories. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, he came to some startling conclusions about some of the problems with that, and was able to make some reifications, and figure some things out that were missing in the picture. And he made notes about this, and some of this gets very technical, so I apologize in advance for some of you who may not be as well-versed in things like physics, engineering, electrical physics, electrical theory, all of these different things. It could get a little confusing and convoluted because they use different descriptors four things that basically relate to the effect of just how much of a measurement of an electrical discharge or charge can you get off of a thing, or how much motion or inertia can be measured. So they use different terms like K and mu, M-U, to describe these different aspects in the mathematical formulae that they use. So he does give a little bit of descriptor of that, but that just shows me that he understood the importance of utilizing the mathematics to look at this framework. And that's the thing that's actually happened in our modern physics. They rely too heavily upon math to explain how things work. And oftentimes it doesn't explain anything. You could plug as many variables in as you want, but if you don't understand the basic precept of what's going on, that doesn't help. <laughs> So that's, that's one of the problems I think he encountered here. He realized it was being described all wrong using this standard model that we're given. So he came to some conclusions. So I'll try to skirt around a little bit of the more technical stuff because there's formulas and stuff here. But we could get the gist of what's going on here in the theoretical framework just by looking at this. So like I said, I apologize in advance if you guys aren't as nerdy as I out there and are not as interested in hearing about this stuff. But... 
I think that this is a hugely important topic because when it comes down to brass tacks, it really shows us for certain we have a real-world framework and timeline for the development of UFO technologies here by man. By man. So that being the case, we have this linear progression where we can show the development of these technologies, and it ties back to this discovery by Dr. Brown in the 1920s and the work he has done since then. And others have picked up upon his work and done some work with it as well. So that being the case, we have this, this clear linear progression of the development of these types of technologies by human beings. So in my estimation, that lends credence to the idea that this UFO phenomenon we see, that we associate with nuts and bolts aircraft or craft in the sky, according to Occam's Razor, these would be man-made. And I think it's important to put that foundation out there for people. Now, does that discredit the whole notion that there may or may not be aliens? No, certainly not. Or that they may or may not have visited here in advanced technologies. Perhaps they have. We don't know where they come from or what the nature of that really is, though. We have to rely upon our imaginations to understand that or listen to some sketchy testimony from people about that. But this shows that there's clearly a whole linear progression of man-made technologies based around this. And we're talking, this is a hundred years. A hundred years now that this was discovered. A hundred years ago. Over a hundred years ago. And actually you could trace back some of the earlier aspects of it to Nikola Tesla back in the early 1900s. He was making some of the same similar discoveries here, but Dr. Brown here discovered the Byfield-Brown effect, and I think this was key to developing electrogravitic technologies. So it's interesting. It also brings into play the idea of the possibility of using this as a type of energy generation device as well. So all of these things are very much in the realm of possibility. And when you could see that there is a man-made man -made history of these types of things, it becomes an important aspect of things. So let's get into the reading. I think I've rambled on long enough for you folks now. The structure of space. It can be pointed out that the failure of the Mickelson-Morley experiment to detect a flow of ether does not necessarily indicate the non-existence of the ether. And I'm going to pause right there after the very first sentence. This is a hugely important idea here as well. You'll notice that Dr. Brown points out that the failure of the Mickelson-Morley experiment to detect a flow of ether does not necessarily indicate the non-existence of the ether. So already here, in his notes, he's already thinking about the old ether physics, the theory of the ether, and is tending to lean towards the existence of the ether. And that's what's missing in our modern form of physics we're handed, the mainstream model of physics. They do not acknowledge an ether. But they try to describe it in other ways by calling it dark matter, dark energy, zero point. All of these different different designations that they've given it in the mainstream model of physics, it's still ether. You could call it whatever you want, but they're trying their best to not have to deal with it. They don't want people to understand the concept of ether. So they've dis they've largely tried to discredit it. And here's the thing. The Mickelson-Morley experiment, they always historically call it a failure. It really wasn't a failure. It just needed to be modified. And in fact, just a couple of years back, I think it was in 2016, some folks down in New Zealand duplicated the experiment, but they turned the apparatus a full 90 degrees, and they were able to get a measurement of an ether flow output. So, 
this is also an interesting concept. So this should have been touted all over the scientific community, but largely it disappeared into obscurity. You could still find it. I think it's at liquidgravity.nz, if I'm not mistaken, or some such website. It was called Liquid Gravity was the name of the experimental model that they, they did this test with. So that's out there. Uh, just here in the the modern age, if you want to call us the modern age with this stuff. So anyway, the whole point here is Brown in his experimentation acknowledged, hey, there has to be some type of a medium through which this effect that I've been able to reproduce is working because the, the model that we have doesn't describe it accurately. Doesn't say exactly what's going on. But if you look at it through the lens of the ether physics model, it seems to work. So he began to accept the idea that perhaps there is an ether. So let's go ahead and continue reading. The results of the theory of relativity may be obtained with or without an ether. So once again, I'm going to pause. I apologize for the many pauses here, but trying to just flesh things out a little bit for you folks here. So Brown found a way in which an ether model would work with what Einstein was presenting. So much of what Einstein was saying was coming to perhaps accurate conclusions, but going about it in the wrong way, if you want to look at it that way. It was being misdescribed, but somehow it was close, close enough in approximation that it gave an accurate assessment of certain things. And you'll note, you'll note that early on, in Einstein's early work, he had to account for what he called the cosmological constant in his theories, in his, his mathematical formulas. So he plugged this in to all his relativity formulas, the cosmological constant, which of course would equate to ether, if you want to go there. So even though they try to make the idea of ether sound silly and nonsensical, it's certainly something that was on their minds, at least Dr. Brown's mind here. So let's go ahead and continue reading. I'll try to interrupt less so that this stuff could sink in a little more. For certain phenomena, it is desirable and almost necessary to assume the existence of an ether in order to evolve a satisfactory explanation. One example is the force of gravitation, particularly the electrogravitational effects. The phenomenon of the movement of a dielectric is such an example. going to pause for a moment here, folks. The dielectric, so this is what he was doing when he discovered the Byfield-Brown effect. He would use dielectric effects to charge a capacitor plate, and he noticed it would induce movement towards the direction of the negative charge. And he couldn't account for this. And we'll see as we continue on here that he was able to duplicate this over and over again in all kinds of different mediums. So it wasn't just the ionic wind explanation, as we're given later. Let's continue on, though. The ether would, then, have many interesting and hitherto unsuspected properties, and it is the purpose of these notes to explore the subject qualitatively and to set forth some of the most important properties. Much of the work is based on facts derived from actual experiments which cannot be satisfactorily explained without the existence of an ether possessing substantially these properties. going to pause for a minute there, folks, before we continue. Just to point out that that statement alone should give pause to anyone out there in the mainstream physics community to go back and take a look at this. This guy was no dummy. He was no dummy. He was one of the top scientists in the world during his time. He was... He was enlisted through the U.S. military, specifically the Naval Department and the intelligence community, to help them with many of their scientific problems of the day. He was the head of some large naval projects to help them to establish various things. He was no dummy, and they knew it, and he was an insider. He was one of their guys that they went to. 
They trusted him implicitly. They trusted him implicitly, and they took his his opinion very seriously on many of these things. So this is not coming from some schlub out there claiming, oh yes, there must be an ether. This guy was one of the top-notch scientific minds of his day. And he realized, hey, these experiments I'm doing, these actual field experiments that I'm performing here cannot be adequately explained by this mainstream model of physics that we're handed. Einstein's theories don't hold water with this. Unless, of course, you add the caveat in that there is indeed an ether. And that's something that's gone on in physics since that time because of the results obtained from the Michelson-Morley experiments. They've largely discredited the idea of ether and never sought to really do any further experimentation to either prove or disprove the existence thereof. At least not in mainstream circles. Not in the public view. But anyway, let's go ahead and we'll continue because the next part here, he explains the meaning of K and Mu. Electromagnetic theory assigns real values to K and Mu of free space. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So Mu, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, now it's been a while since I've looked at any type of physics Mu, I think, represents inertia, or perhaps it uh, represents uh, resistance or friction, or one or the other. That's, that's what K and Mu are. One's inertia, the other one's like friction or resistance to movement, if I'm remembering correctly. I don't remember which one is which, though. Uh, but that's when you get to the mathematical aspects and stuff of it. So let's go ahead and I'll read that again and we'll continue from there. Just to kind of put that out there as a basis for people to reflect on this. Electromagnetic theory assigns real values to K and Mu of free space. For the sake of simplicity, the ether may be imagined to represent merely these real values. It follows logically that space may not be uniform and that variations will occur in K and Mu. Okay, so I'm going to pause right there for a moment. So he's saying here, ether, whether it exists or not, we could use these accepted variables that they use in figuring out these mathematical equations to represent it. So the friction and the inertia. We could use these things to, in a sense, quantify or measure the ether field or to represent the ether field in his experiments. So are you with me with this? I hope so. So this is an important idea. So now we understand by understanding how to work out the math, you can account for ether in this way. And it doesn't make ether sound so silly. In fact, all it does is it makes it a type of pressure mediation. Gravity would be pressure mediation when it gets down to understanding how this works. Let's read on and uh, we'll connect the dots a little further as we go. It is logical also to assume that space is distorted by the presence of matter and that this distortion actually may be a variation of K and Mu. Going to pause there. So essentially... What he's saying here is that matter or mass distorts space in the accepted standard model of physics. This is what Einstein's talking about with his theories. Space-time, you see, this is what they claim, that gravity is actually the warping of space-time, the fabric of space-time. So you have a big mass, and it puts a kind of indentation into the, the fabric of space-time as he describes it here. So what Brown is suggesting here is instead of thinking of it in terms of space-time, and this actually warps or distorts the fabric of space-time, as they try to explain it in the mainstream model, he's saying think of it like this. Think of it as being a variation in these standards of K and Mu, or it's perhaps it's the ether field. Ether. So this would be in inertia and a friction, 
interaction of sorts. It would be like pressure mediation as the best way to describe it, really. Pressure mediation, where in the object or the mass in the sense of gravity will move towards this central point here that our mainstream physics describes as the larger mass, but it may not be the larger mass that it moves toward. It may be this point in what we might refer to as counter space that it's moving towards instead, you see. And that's what some of these mathematical reifications can, can suggest here if you look at it through the lens of an ether model of physics. Perhaps it's not the physical mass itself, perhaps it's some phenomena related to the physical mass. So it's not warping space-time, it's just the way in which the dielectric field will move towards this. And we'll get to this as we go a little further. I hope I'm not butchering this explanation here. I could picture how it works in my mind, but I lack the words to describe it in an in, in accurate type sense here. And that, I think, is what makes it difficult for physicists to assess as well. But let's go ahead and we'll read on here. It is logical also to assume that space is distorted by the presence of matter, and that this distortion actually may be a variation of K and Mu. Finally, it is necessary to assign the direction or sense of the variation, and that clue is supplied by the behavior of a light ray in, a pa in passing a massive body. Thus, the deflection of light is toward the massive body, and the effect is similar to or identical with refraction. It may be concluded that the values of K and Mu near a massive body are greater. As a matter of fact, the gravitational field may be visualized as an area or region of higher K and Mu. The force of gravitation would then be the tendency to migrate to the higher K and Mu. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So what he's suggesting here is in contradiction to what the mainstream physics model physics model presents. The mainstream physics model presents mass. The idea of mass is what produces the idea of gravity. And that the greater the mass, the stronger the gravity towards that greater mass. Things will be drawn toward that greater mass due to the, to the nature of the mass of the object. And he's saying something different here. He's saying that there may be a relationship between mass and what we observe to be this gravitational effect, but the gravitational effect may have nothing to do with the actual mass of the object, and it has to do with these higher K and Mu values, which he would des describe if he was looking at it from the ether f physics perspective, is he would describe this as pressure within the ether, moving pressure systems within the ether, high and low pressure systems. And the ether permeates everything and exists all around it and within it and through it here. But that's the framework upon which everything is built. And there were earlier scientists who took the ether idea seriously. And in fact, I think it was Tesla described light as nothing more than a sound wave in the ether. So when we see light, the medium through which it travels is ether. Because think about that. You need a medium for something to go through or travel through to something else to get from one place to the other. It has to move through some type of a medium. Now sound, the medium that sound moves through is the air or water or whatever that we're familiar with here. But we use the example of sound through the air. A sound wave would travel through the air. Well, light needs a medium. And the medium through which it travels is ether according to some of the old ether physics theories. And that would be logical, considering they try to tell us that space or outer space is an absolute vacuum or void. Well, how does uh, a wave of something travel through a non-medium? Think about that. And, and that's where the contradistinction comes in in a lot of this stuff. But uh, So anyway, Brown here is arguing that perhaps it's not mass, which is the cause of gravitation, but it's this variation in pressure between K and Mu within the ether. So I hope that gives an adequate description of what he's trying to put together here. Now let's continue on, and I think it'll start to make a little more sense to you. Like I said, it is de definitely technical, 
the nature of some of these writings, but it's necessarily so. But let's continue on. Another interpretation is that the force of gravitation is a pressure from the areas of low K mu to those of high K mu. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So he's putting the word, the, the terms K and mu together into one term here because it could be variations in either portion of the field here. It's a dualistic field. One, like I said, represents inertia, and the other one represents resistance or friction to the inertia. The, the, this would relate to inertia would be the continuous movement of a thing, and the resistance or friction against that would be the thing that slows it down and stops it. So that's what he's talking about. So pressure variations from the areas of low K mu to the areas of high K mu. So negative to positive, remember that as we continue on here. It follows that a low K mu may be actually a region of high pressure in space, causing objects to move towards regions of lower pressure. This may be called ether pressure, or space pressure, and may be assigned to the terms of high or low space potential, as the case may be. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So at any point here where he's referring to K mu, this just simply means ether pressure. Remember that. Because he daresn't use the term ether in his descriptions here, because he's trying to put these thoughts together for people who accept wholesale the modern notion or the accepted model of physics that we have. This Einsteinian model of physics we've been handed, the relativistic theory. So he's trying to connect the dots for those folks. So there you go. So think about that. So ether pressure. So when he's referring to K-mu, he's referring to ether pressure. Let's continue on. Perhaps it is intuitively reasonable to assume that a maximum potential or entropy exists and that lower potentials are present as determined by the presence of massive bodies in space. We might consider the maximum potential of space, that value where no mass is present, even at infinite distance. It is not present, actually, even in the space between the galaxies. And he quotes here from... He has a little notation here talking about Oliver Heaviside in his electromagnetic theory. So he makes a little notation at the bottom of the page referring to this. So no mass at infinite distance. So when you're thinking about no mass at infinite distance and then you have a mass and you have pressure behind that mass, the pressure pushes that mass towards the area of no mass. It's a simple matter of the pressure mediation. If you have empty space and you have pressurized gas, let's, let's use that example, a container. Okay, you have a container, an empty container, and you have pressurized gas, and you want to put the pressurized gas in the container. Well, it flows in on its own and fills in that space, and that's because of pressure mediation. So if you have a vacuum an area of vacuum, and you unseal the vacuum, the air pressure comes rushing in. Same thing could be said as another example. We'll use this whole nonsensical Titan sub submersible thing that happened a few weeks back now as an example of this. This is what we're talking about, pressure. So there was external pressure from the water, the depth of water on the outside of the, the cabin of this alleged submersible and inside it was supposed to be pressurized with air to counterbalance the pressure of the water from the sea but something happened there was a, a i guess a leak or something or something wasn't properly sealed and therefore what happens is the pressure will seek that inlet to relieve the pressure. So to relieve the pressure, it will fill the container, and it did so almost instantaneously, thus crushing it into oblivion. So that's essentially the same type of thing. If you have a medium, and there's an empty area, a null point, the pressure mediation will automatically push the medium into that empty space. Same thing happens in the ether here. It's the same type of a deal. So if you have an empty point, 
that the pressure can move towards or that the the medium can move towards the pressure will automatically push it there that's just a natural fact of how things work in this reality you could use water as an example of that all day and empty containers and a container with no water in it wherever the inlet is it will automatically just the water will run in there because that's the nature of how it goes if it with the pressure but at any rate uh, not to belabor that point for too long Let's go ahead and continue reading here. So he's saying here, where no mass is present, even at in infinite distance, this can cause an ether pressure. Let's continue. An interesting mechanical analogy is a lightly stretched rubber diaphragm without mass, the periphery of which is at infinity. Any mass would distort the sheet downward and by an amount inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the mass, thus also two masses, would be pressed toward one another. And he has an example here. He has a little drawing of what you would consider maybe two little metal balls sitting on top of a stretched out piece of rubber. And you know what would happen. They would kind of roll towards the center, towards each other, and they would make a little divot in the piece of rubber and rest there. And this is largely what's been described in our modern model of physics, the accepted model of physics, as being mass having an effect on space-time. That's how they describe it. So however you do describe it, you see the, the whole point here. So let's go ahead and continue on. So he says the maximum pressure of space can be determined from the energy contained in matter. And he gives a little formula here where it says 1 gram equals 25 million kWh kilowatt hours. I guess that's what that means. Or he gives a more a more complex formula here 1.25 times 10 to the 16th power pounds per square inch in pressure so that's what he's saying the pressure the ether pressure is and this would be what they would call zero point vacuum energy this kind of thing that's what they say the, the measure of that energetic field is now that's a huge massive number so the energy potential there is immense and that's why the push for things like zero-point energy have interested people so much. Because to be able to tap that field, that zero-point field, and capture that, well, essentially it's ether pressure, and use that to power electrical devices, you could have infinite free power that is inherently everywhere all at once without affecting the environment. And that is something that the mainstream corporations and power structure of today do not want. Because if you had access to this, well, pretty much destroys the whole financial system, doesn't it? Think about that. If everybody had a type of device that could access this ether pressure and use it to generate electricity, they could easily, with the... the the energetic potential that's described here of this this ether pressure they could easily power whatever devices they need for eternity with just a device maybe the size of a car engine you could run your whole house no problems no dropouts infinite energy at no cost and that's where the problem comes in a device like this would have very few moving components, if any. It would be very practical, and there are people trying to develop these types of devices. So, it's an interesting concept. And this is where the notion of zero point comes from then. So, Brown recognized this how long ago, and was writing notes, copious notes here about this how long ago, complete with references he gives and notations because here he gives as a reference for that 1.25 times 10 to the 16th power pounds per square inch to a guy named Ross in his I guess it's a book or an article must be a book new view of space matter and time and he gives the page number there as a reference here to his citation so think about that so if there's this ether field that does exist and I'm thoroughly convinced at this point that the ether field does exist. 
this ether pressure is everywhere all the time because it's the substrate upon which all of our reality and our physicality and material world is built. It's there, it's present, and if we could tap that field, well, we could solve so many problems, and I think it's actually been done. But they want to keep that development hidden from the masses. Let's continue reading here. So he says, actually, it is difficult to imagine that the energy is contained in matter. More likely, it is the energy of space when referred to a complete void. For example, a glass globe evacuated, submerged to its crushing depth in the deep sea, would suddenly disintegrate and send out a wave motion possessing energy. But the energy was contained not in the evacuated globe, but in the pressure of the water surrounding the globe. going to pause for a moment here, folks. So absolutely... What Brown is detailing here seems to be true. So this ether pressure is inherently there, and it's just a matter of how do we tap that? How do we create the situation wherein we have some type of a container, void of this ether, that we can use as a conduit for the ether to inflow into, to in, for an influx of the ether to go into. And if you can do that, that's your tapping your zero point field in those types of terms. So, if that's the case, if you can tap that and maybe make a generator or something based upon that, you could have infinite energy because of just the, the pressure here, the potential that's given here. But let's continue reading here. So he goes on to say, It might appear that mankind lives in an ether sea of tremendous pressure, an ether sea likewise of unbelievable energy. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So if a scientist like Dr. T. Townsend Brown was talking about this in the 1950s, I think... A guy like this, talking about this stuff, and actually being able to demonstrate through experimentation that it seems likely that's what a portion of what's going on has to do with, then, then, people need to stand up and pay attention to this. This could be something hugely important to the future of mankind. We can solve any type of energy crisis that this world has, and I assure you there's no energy crisis. Any type of a crisis of that sort is contrived. We have the resources here in this beautiful world. It's just a matter that there's those who are greedy at the top of the power structure that want to limit the usage of things and limit the abilities of human beings in general that they don't deem worthy to have any such type of access to a thing. So they keep these types of ideas hidden away, locked away, in special access programs, hidden deep under the noses of the public faces of authority in this world. It's locked up in black programs, folks. I, I am pretty much thoroughly convinced at this point that this technology exists and has existed for a long time and has been used to many, many effects and that if they wanted to, they could release this to the world, and the world could be changed. The world could be changed so much for the better through the advent of these technologies. Only thing is, if they were to do that, it would totally, totally shake up the entire power structure of this world. It would decentralize power away from governments and quasi-governments and corporations and all of these different places that like to have control. And they will not allow that to happen. And even if they do want that to happen, it would have to be a very carefully controlled type of a release of these types of technologies. Because to do so too quickly will cause utter chaos and may actually be problematic for some time. But I think at the end of the day, things would shake out to be a lot better. You wouldn't have wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have now. And the thing is that doesn't benefit 
those people who would like to be the one percenters of the world. They want to be special. They view themselves as special. They want to be better than everyone. So they want to have better access to resources, better things than others, more wealth, more prestige, more power over others. And in order to maintain that, they can't let this fall into the hands of the public. And thus they've kept it hidden in black projects for a hundred years. A hundred years. That's pretty heavy duty, isn't it? The implications of this type of technology would be world-changing were it to be released to the public for public consumption. Were we actually told how to do this, how to produce this? And I, I'm pretty sure there are corporations out there that have blueprints on how to build such a device with ease. And perhaps there does exist even perhaps some breakaway civilization that uses these technologies. And maybe there is a secret space program. I can't claim to know the answers to all that. I'm fascinated by the topic and the subject, and I've looked very deeply into it. It's really hard to find any resolution to that rabbit hole. Really is. There are those that claim that, yes, this secret space program does exist, and now Trump put a public face on it. They call it Space Force. That's a, a laughing stock. I think everybody knows it. But there's always been rumors of this secret space program, and this secret space program has existed under the auspices of an organization known as the NRO since the 1960s, and it was kept secret, totally unacknowledged. The public had no idea it existed for 30-plus years. It was only in the 1990s that they even disclosed the existence of this organization, so don't tell me they can't keep secrets. They most certainly can. But uh, anyway, I don't want to get too hung up on a side tangent. Let's get back into the actual physics surrounding this, because that's why I'm speaking on it tonight. And like I said, I apologize for those out there who may not be quite as nerdy or interested in this stuff as I am, but I found these notes and I thought... This was absolutely spot on, 100%. What you could call maybe smoking gun evidence of a clear delineation of a linear progression of these technologies developed by human beings in secret since at least the 1920s. So, with that being the case, puts a whole new spin on the whole modern UFO phenomenon, doesn't it? Especially when you consider that much of the modern UFO era didn't start until around the time frame of World War II, and shortly thereafter came to public attention and scrutiny. That being the case, we have all kinds of different stories about perhaps Nazis developing saucer-shaped craft and things of that nature, Foo Fighters being seen during the war, and then after the war... Just two years post-war, 1947, you had the whole Kenneth Arnold thing and the whole debacle with the whole Roswell incident and all the fallout from all of that stuff that has now become a mythology unto itself. And we still have the attention of this whole UFO phenomenon, but now, they're once again, they're still drumming up the whole alien card and trying to make it appear as if these technologies must be alien in origin. They must be. Well, I think it's demonstrable from what we have here. That might not be the case, but let's go ahead and continue reading. Since unit positive and negative charges are the building blocks of all matter, it is worthwhile to speculate on the space structure of the blocks themselves. In this, one is guided by relatively meager evidence of an experimental nature. But perhaps a good start may be had by considering the mass effects of both, since it already appears that mass increases k mu and reduces space energy. Going to pause for a moment. Remember, k mu would be ether pressure and reduces space energy. So we have the idea that mass increases ether pressure and reduces space energy. So with that being the case, mass would kind of produce this pressure point 
or this positive pressure within the ether field, I guess is the best term here. And the positive would push towards the negative, where the reduced space energy would be. Uh, so that, that's kind of what he's delineating here. So he's looking at this in terms of positive and negative charges being the building blocks of all matter. Of course, he's talking about what we would accept as the atom, where it has the proton, which is the positive, and the electron, which is the negative, and it's an electric dynamo. That's what an atom is. So if you use the even older concept of the hermetic philosophy of as above, so below, then you could probably correlate a similar effect to the ether. Perhaps it has a positive and negative attribute, a positive and negative charge, and this would re equate to the pressure mediation, as it were, here. So that's what I think is being inferred here. And it seems to align with what can be demonstrated in a lot of ways, but let's continue on. Since the proton appears to possess the greater share of the mass of the atom, one would conclude that the positive field increases k mu, or ether pressure. For the sake of symmetry, the negative field decreases k mu to the limit permitted by k mu of massless space. Conversely, the space energy of the electron field approaches that of space devoid of massive bodies and outward or radial pressures are maximum. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So this would be relating back to that whole thing he was talking about earlier with this space devoid of all mass being infinite. Remember, we, t we had uh, touched on that point earlier on here, and he, he quoted Oliver Heaviside with that. Uh, so this is all primarily about pressure mediation, as we see here. So he says in the atom, the proton, it could be divulged that this would be where the the pressure gradient would be higher in the ether, just related to how, what we see with mass here on the, the larger scale. So that being the case, he's, he's kind of making that comparison here. Let's read on. When the unit positive and negative charges are combined, as in the case of a neutron or atom, the increased k mu or ether pressure of the positive is not completely neutralized by the decreased k mu of the negative. So that would be the decreased pressure of the negative. So think in terms of the atom. So the increased pressure of the, the proton is not completely neutralized by the decreased pressure of the electron. So this creates... A type of motion. If there's, if it's unequal, that means something's got to move or something's got to give. So he's inferring the same thing on a large scale here as well. And within the ether field, the ether field that exists alongside, within, and all around everything else here. Remember that. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around because we're just taught to think in terms of, you know, this 3D reality we live in. But this ether field permeates everything. It's the scaffolding upon which all of our reality is constructed. The ether field. So let's remember that and keep that in mind as we go. So he says, when the positive and negative charges are combined, as in the case of the neutron or atom, the increased k-mu of the positive is not completely neutralized by the decreased k-mu of the negative, though the areas are equal and electrical neutrality results. A slight positive k-mu at the center of the system remains. Thus, an aggregate of these residual positive k-mus produces the pure gravitational effects of neutral matter. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So he's making the inference here that perhaps the thing that we know as gravitation or gravity is produced by just this slight higher pressure variation in the dynamo that is the atom. So although it creates an electrically neutral thing, the pressure, the ether pressure, is still slightly unequalized. So therefore, the mass exerted by the atom or by whatever other object creates a slight push in the medium of ether. Now, what I find most intriguing and interesting about this is if you go back 
and you look at Bob Lazar's testimony as to how the electrogravitic propulsion system on the uh, alleged spacecraft that he worked on to reverse engineer, if you look at how he claims that worked, it's based upon what he calls a secondary type physics, a secret physics that we're not taught in the mainstream. And he talks about two forms of gravity. You can go back and look at his video. In fact, I, I posted it recently at thealchemicalbeacon.substack.com. I posted his testimony in one of my articles that I've done looking at this stuff, where he gives his whole spiel in this old 1991, I want to say, video that he put out, was the first time he introduced all of this stuff to the world, and he told people how these alleged flying saucers work, that there's what he calls gravity A and gravity B. Now, gravity A is the gravity we're all familiar with. It's on the large scale that we see. And gravity B, he claims, works on a subatomic level in a similar fashion to what Dr. Brown is describing here. That at some point, using what he claims is element 115, which I think there's a little bit of misinformation going on with that, perhaps. Now, I do reserve the right to be totally wrong about that. But he says through using this element 115 and hitting it with a particle beam the way they do in a little cyclotron, it produces these stable atoms, which produce a high efficient of this gravity B wave, which he calls, which generates from the atom itself on a subatomic level. And they throw that through an amplifier and through a waveguide, and they're able to create a gravitational field from that. That's what Bob Lazar claims, okay? You could go back and watch his video to get his exact wording and phraseology on all of this, but this has a tendency to align a bit here with what Dr. Brown is saying. Only problem is Lazar comes at it from the purely physics standpoint of the mainstream, the relativistic theory, instead of recognizing what it really is, the ether, the gradation of the pressure in the ether. But still, operationally, it would work exactly the same, but it's being misdescribed to us by Lazar. This is not how it truly operates. It's not creating this microgravity field that's just slightly stronger it's pressure mediation in the ether. Somehow it's creating a type of uh, an influx within the ether and using the pressure. It's depressurizing the front where the waveguide points out to. It's reducing the pressure ahead and increasing the pressure behind from negative to positive, as Brown describes here. And this is what causes the anti-gravitational effect or the gravity effect. But I found this interesting because I'd, I'd, been, I'd listened to Bob Lazar try to describe this many times. And something just clicked in my head when I read this in Brown's paper here. Because it makes perfect sense when it's described through the auspices or the lens of ether physics. And I think that's kind of where we're missing the boat. We've been trained to think in this Einsteinian physics model in the modern era, the accepted model of physics. We don't accept that there's an ether. Any scientist that's worth their salt today will say that the ether thing's been disproven long ago, and they'll usually quote the Michelson-Morley experiment <laughs> as, you know, their, their proof of this and uh, that kind of thing. But really, there hasn't been much follow-up as to figuring out how to manipulate this ether field at least not in the public space. Now, in the secret access programs, I, I'm pretty sure they've done so. So let's read on here, though. But I, I hope I'm not losing anybody on any of this. He says there, It is readily understandable that regions of positive K moves will be driven together by space energy, and it is fairly understandable that regions of negative K moves will be driven apart. Perhaps it would be better to say that normal intergalactic space has positive k mu, that regions more positive are driven together, and that regions less positive are driven apart. 
These latter regions may be considered anti-gravitational and are driven out of the field in the same manner as a dielectric of low K is driven out of an electrostatic field with high K, or as a diamagnetic substance is driven out of a magnetic field with high mu. Going to pause for a second here, folks. So he's making the comparison here between electromagnetism and gravity. Gravity being the effects of this dielectric within the medium of the ether. So I think that's what the suggestion is. Gravity is a manifestation of the electromagnetic effect, but within the ether. Manifests slightly differently. But I think there's something to that way of thinking. But let's continue on here. For the sake of convenience, it is desirable to specify the minimum as the value present in extragalactic space at an infinite distance from all matter. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So essentially, this is one of the ways in which we could understand perhaps how this ether field works. So what he's describing here as space at an infinite distance from all matter, this is like, uh, how, what could we describe it? Maybe, maybe counter space would be the best way to describe this, moving towards counter space. All things within our reality will tend to move towards that counter space, that counter spatial point. So it's, it's all part of this pressure mediation idea. So it would be akin to this lower pressure is infinitely far away. And the high pressure would be centered in places where there's more mass. That's the best way to describe it. So that the, the mass would tend to move towards this area infinitely far away. But let's, let's continue reading here. So he says, this value will be negative with respect to the value of K mu, or ether pressure, as we know it in intragalactic space surrounded as we are by massive bodies. Assuming the accepted value of K mu equals unity, then K mu, or ether pressure, minimum, may be less than unity if proper units are selected. The potential energy maximum is when K mu, or ether pressure, is less than unity. Any real value of K mu indicates the presence of lower potential of space and a lower velocity of light. A ray of light, therefore, will describe a path through space as if it were bent by space pressures on the sides of the ray, as if the ray possessed mass going to pause for a moment here, folks. So essentially, he's offering an alternate explanation to the things that Einstein theorized that scientists today have allegedly proven with relativity theory that the gravity or the mass of an object, if it's big enough, can actually bend light. Bend light. And this is how they prove, quote-unquote, prove the concept of space-time. And that space-time can be warped in this way. Well, this is a man-made reification, and Dr. Brown here is describing it as nothing more than the influence of this ether pressure. It has nothing to do with bending or warping space-time. It's the ether pressure in which space itself exists, what we would acknowledge as space, or matter, or mass exists. So let's go ahead and continue reading. So he says, increased K-mu, or ether pressure, and decreased velocity of light go hand in hand. In intragalactic space, electrons are driven apart. In extragalactic space, electrons do not exist as such. As an electron approaches extragalactic space, the space energy or pressure gradient which makes it an entity ceases to exist. It is conceivable that as an electron gains velocity, its K mu, or ether pressure, becomes positive, approaching infinite mass as the velocity approaches C, or the speed of light. C representing the speed of light here. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So once again, he's trying to reify these things in terms of mainstream physics in certain ways, and he's talking about 
space between the stars being different from the space among the stars. I don't think there's any such distinction. <laughs> but I think he's trying to just reify certain ideas that were accepted by the astronomy of the time and by the mainstream model of physics that we do have. And maybe he's right. Maybe there is this differential. There has to be the differential in order for the pressure mediation to occur. So there has to be this area of null, null ether, where there's no ether that the ether will flow towards. So we have this that exists, and who knows what the absolute boundary of this may or may not be. For purposes here, you would say it's infinitely far away that this moves towards, because it's not an actual physical place in space. And that's the thing that causes all the more mystery that surrounds us. That absolutely denotates that there's more to this reality than what we know. Where does the pressure move towards? Where does the ether flow towards? What does it flow into? Where is this empty spot where there is no ether that the ether flows into? It's infinitely far away. And we may never find where that is. But we have this centralized pressure here, this ether pressure, because of, well, the mass, they say. And I don't know, maybe it's just something inherent about matter or mass itself that causes this type of uh, a, um, an echo effect in the ether, I guess is probably the best way to, to put it. Causes displacement in the ether. If you think of the ether in terms of sim being similar to water, perhaps, maybe that's the better way to try to analogize this and wrap your brain around it. But let's go ahead and continue here with what Dr. Brown has written, because that's the important p portion here. My uh, fleeting thoughts about this are probably confusing <laughs> for, for people, but, uh, you know, I, I hope you're following. So he goes on and he says, protons or positrons as the case may be, have a natural positive k mu or ether pressure, which increases as the field increases towards the center of the positive charge. Space energy drives these particles together, but well-known electrical forces drive them apart. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So I think this is where the rubber meets the road, and this is one of the important parts with this. He's saying here, well-known electrical forces drive them apart. So the notion here is mass, positive mass, increases the ether pressure towards the center of the mass. But there's positive, there's well-known electrical forces that drive apart this notion of this, this pressure. So it'll cause this pressure to flow outwards from where it is when you apply certain electrical currents to it. So keep that in mind. So that's important because that tells us that perhaps there's a way that they can cause a type of vacuum of the ether, an absence of the ether in a portion of space here, through which or into which the ether can then flow, this high energy pressure field can then flow. So this denotates the possibility of creating a zero-point energy device of sorts, if you want to call it that. I'm just trying to use some of the better-known terms for this stuff in the modern era. So this would create that type of free energy device. But it's not free energy because first you have to apply an electrical charge to get that energy in. But once you do, once you have that, then it will become what they call over unity. Once this pressure, this massively huge pressure flows into there. So if you could access this ether pressure, you could cause this to create a type of over unity device, like they call it. So it would be free energy. You would have to put one time electrical output in from some other source, and then it could run for infinity on its own if you have the, the mechanism built properly. That's the whole point. I mean, that, that's, that's what the dream is. That's what the notion is. 
and that's what uh, is I think I think that's what Dr. Brown's describing here. I could be wrong, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's what it sounds like to me, but let's go ahead and continue reading here. So he says that uh, through these well-known electrical forces that drive them apart. He says the energy situation is just the reverse. Positrons may not exist in the hearts of dense stars for the reason that the energy or pressure differential ceases to exist. Electrons and positrons are complementary, one tending to increase and the other to decrease. The space potential of the region wherein they exist. So that's... Uh, that. I'll read that again because that sounded kind of choppy the way I read it. So electrons and positrons are complementary, one tending to increase and the other to decrease the space potential of the region wherein they exist. The combination of an electron and a positron is electrically neutral, but the slight positive value of k mu or ether pressure remains to give the combination mass. In extragalactic space, the neutralizing effect of the electron is lost, and the combination, if indeed it can exist, is a particle of great mass, whereas at the center of a star the effect is reversed and a value of ether pressure or KMU is reached where mass no longer increases. In other words, the mass of a particle increases as the space energy increases. This increase in mass is present where the velocity of light has increased due to lower k mu or ether pressure. The two, therefore, are closely related. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So essentially we see what he's saying is this could create a type of uh, a situation where the ether pressure pushes outward from the center of a thing then towards that null point in infinity. So you would have what would be considered a reverse gravitational effect then. So things aren't drawn to the center of an object. They're pushed out from towards infinity. So this creates a reverse situation of what we observe in the natural world, where you have a massive body like, say, the Earth, and things seem to be attracted to the center of the Earth, they fall down towards the Earth, whereas when you apply some of these well-known electrical phenomena to the system, the reverse can happen. That's what he's saying here. It creates this, this pressure wave in the ether that does the opposite and will push in the opposite direction. So let's go ahead and read on because now he connects some dots for us. Electrogravitational relation. Considering the space potential of extragalactic space, the field around a unit positive charge is the only field which is present. The direction of the force is toward the center of the charge, and the gradient increases toward the center. It is the slope of the slope which causes the difference in space potential toward the center of the charge, whereas the electric field is merely the slope. The gravitational field is the first derivative of the electric field. Get a pause for a moment here, folks. I'm going to repeat that last phrase. The gravitational field is the first derivative of the electric field. And we need to understand he's talking about the slope of the slope. So this would be a mathematical way to describe how, how this pressure mediation would occur what it would look like, you could calculate it in a certain way based upon these criteria that were met here and these numbers that were given earlier. Let's read on here. So he says, in intragalactic space, a negative charge produces a gravitational vector away from the charge. This is due to the fact that space energy and pressure is greater than that normal for the region. A combination of a positive charge and a negative charge arranged as a dipole produces a unidirectional gravitational vector from the negative to the positive pole. 
If the positive charge is borne by an electrode of large mass or high density and the negative charge by one of low density, the unidirectional vector is increased. For example, polarized PBO along the line of motion. Summarizing the above, a strong electric field affects the state of space energy. Regions of high space potential are to be found nearest the point negative charge and regions of low space potential nearest the positive point, point charge. The line of stress or force normally connects the two opposite charges. The quantity is a vector depending upon the rate of change of slope of the electric field directed away from the negative charge and toward the positive charge. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So essentially what he's describing here is if you generate this negative charge and a positive charge towards the positive charge, this creates what they call a rate of change of the slope. So this would tell you what the gradient of the movement would be here. Essentially, you can calculate you can calculate the way that this pressure would mediate in this way, which direction it would go and how fast it would likely go based upon the slope that you would figure. Now this is all mathematical reifications of things, and I know it gets somewhat confusing at times, but it is important because then you can you actually have something to work with. You have a model you could work with here to determine how fast can you get something to go if you're able to manipulate this type of a field. And you can manipulate this type of a field ostensibly by using negative and positive charged ends of a of a mass. So one end has a negative electric charge, the other end has a positive, and in changing the current and directing the current from the negative to, to the positive pole of this device, you can cause it to move forward towards the positive in theory. Because what this does is it will create ether pressure behind the negative pole and it'll create this notion of infinite empty space in front of the positive pole so therefore it will give it a forward motion and it will give it an accelerated motion because it will be based upon a type of a slope idea mathematically so because of the gradient so I hope I'm making sense to you. I am not a physicist, and sometimes I have a hard time trying to describe these things in a way that makes sense. But this would cause accelerated speed, rapid, rapidly accelerating speed, if you're able to produce this, this type of a, a longitudinal wave in the ether. And I say longitudinal wave because that's what this would be. It's kind of like punching a hole through the ether through which... A device can just be pushed. So it opens a hole one in one direction ahead of whatever this device is you're building. And it causes from the backside the pressure that would naturally fill in to push the craft or the device through that hole it created or punched through. And this is also the basis of what's called scalar technology, folks. So it's much the same thing being described in my estimation here, but it's being described through the auspices of an ether physics model, a kind of a, uh, a type of hybrid ether physics model mixed with our modern accepted physics, the mainstream model. So when you look at it from that point of view and you accept the notion of the reality of ether, it puts a lot of things in clearer focus. So I think this is definitely a technology that can possibly be built. I think it has been built. I think it's been thoroughly tested and perfected. And I think they're keeping it hidden from us because the whole notion of this technology could be world-changing. Like I said, you're talking about things like electrogravitic or anti-gravitic propulsion systems or gravity control systems, free energy, communications, 
instantaneous communications. Not to mention, well, the way I'm sure it's been weaponized. That's what they do first with this stuff. It could be weaponized in a certain way. I have no doubt, and scalar technology has been said to be weaponized by the military-industrial complex. So at any rate, I think that this is an important an important topic to cover, even though it is a little bit technical and sometimes sometimes I'm you might get a little lost if you're not really into this kind of thing or into this way of thinking or if you have a limited scientific background, sometimes gets a little bit much. But honestly, it's as simple as that. It's pressure mediation. It's going from high pressure to low pressure. Simple as that. Picture an empty container, an empty glass jar. You push it down in the water in the bathtub. The water rushes in to the empty container. Same type of thing. It's pressure mediation going on. The pressure is there. It's inherently there. Much like the submersible example we gave. The ocean pressure is ambient. It's there. It's just something happened that opened up a path for the pressure to enter in because there was not equilibrium there. There was no longer equilibrium within inside the submersible. So because that pressure, that ambient pressure that existed had a, a method of inflowing into there, well, it poof, instantly crushed it into oblivion. And Brown describes something similar here as an example, as we've gone through. So it's as simple as that. They overcomplicate a lot of this stuff, try and make it sound like uh, we have to have these really super fast-paced rocket engines or something to try and get into outer space and this and that, and it's... It's all grasping at the wind, folks. That's what all of that is. That's what any type of a mainstream space program that they hand us is. It's a grasping at the wind. It's it's a staged thing. All the world is a stage. It's a show. That's all it is. It's all for show. They've never achieved anything significant with it. If they did achieve any types of significant advances in quote-unquote space or space technology, it was through the use of devices like this that Brown's describing, not through the stupid Apollo program or any such thing. And that's a big if. I don't accept that we've ever been beyond low Earth orbit because I don't think it's possible to exit this place because I do think this place is self-contained in a certain way, self-contained. There's definitive boundaries, in my estimation, and I don't think we could leave this place bodily or physically. It's a pressurized system that we live in. So remember that. And I do reserve the right to be totally wrong about all of that, but I haven't seen anything that significantly convinces me that we can actually leave this place, even with this type of technology. But this type of technology would be revolutionary and would change the world in a hurry. And perhaps with this type of technology, we can figure a way to maybe do that if it is a possible thing. So I don't know. I don't know, but I just find this topic very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. And I think it's important moving forward, especially now that they've really pushed the notion of UFO disclosure and stuff again. And of course, they're trying to present us aliens and all of the stuff that goes with that. Trying to condition the human mind to accept that. They've been doing that for a long time. Trying to convince us of that. Oh, this is so highly advanced, we couldn't possibly build this. Human beings couldn't have done that. Tell you the same thing about the stinking pyramids, right? (laughs) Oh, that that couldn't have been done by human beings, really. 
I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> it, it, Occam's razor would say that it was. We know that there's human beings and that human beings lived in that area at the time, so therefore logic would dictate that human beings built it. Same thing with these flying saucer craft and these UFO craft we see. We know there's human beings and we know human beings have secret military programs where they build secret aircraft. Chances are that's what that is. It's a human-built aircraft. It's a stretch to say it's aliens coming from some other planet somewhere with no evidence to support that. Nothing but hearsay and second-hand from second-hand sources telling you of the existence of aliens with no proof or evidence so keep that in mind a lot of it has to do with the psyop but i assure you folks i think there's something to this and these notes these notes from dr t tom townsend brown really paint a picture for me that this technology is probably a lot further advanced than they would like us to think that they've been able to develop it and who knows what they've done with it have they been off world are they able to go off world i don't know i would suspect maybe they tried and couldn't get there and that frightened them so they had to keep pushing this notion of extraterrestrials and other planets and all that science fiction trope that goes with it to maintain control here what's the more frightening thought think about this for a minute what's the more frightening thought to think that perhaps there's other alien races out there who might be able to come and harm us in some way or exterminate us that perhaps there's dozens or thousands of different civilizations out there that could potentially come here or we could go and meet them or is it a more frightening thought to know that even with advanced technologies like this and the ability to potentially travel through infinite space with a technology like this, you discover you can't go anywhere. There's a barrier up there blocking your way and you don't know who or what is beyond that barrier and you can't get there physically. That would be a frightening thing, wouldn't it? Especially if the description of this physical barrier aligns with things taught in, say, the Bible of a firmament, the dome of the sky, the great arch, if you want to go to the Freemasonic ideas of the sky, the royal arch, dome. If it looks like that, then that reaffirms some things that were said in certain books certain books like the holy bible and if that proves to be true if that's what they went up there and found and it reaffirms the things taught in the bible well that would indicate that hey time out the Bible's probably true then, and that means that there is a God, and I am accountable for my actions here. That's a frightening thought to a lot of people, a lot of people who have done deplorable things in this world. Don't you think that would put them in a full-fledged panic? Perhaps that's why they've doubled down on this whole notion of artificial intelligence and transhumanism and merging your mind with the, the machine. That would leave you locked in. They would be locked in. Locked into this physical place. Would make them the gods of this place. Then they could envision anything they want and make you believe anything they want to be true. With that notion. Just some food for thought, folks. I know that's kind of a, a strange way to to end this here tonight, but I, that's where we're going to leave it. To show the reasoning, perhaps, why they try to keep these things secret and don't want anybody to find out. Because they don't want you to know where you exist. Because if you know where you exist and you know who you are and what you are, and who your creator is, who your God is, 
and that you are accountable to some higher power. That there is more than this place. If you know that, then that makes them less able to control you. You know there's something sovereign beyond them. They don't want you to know that. They want you to think government is the be-all, end-all. Science is the be-all, end-all. That they, these dark occultists at the top of the power structure who run things in this world, are the be-all, end-all. And of course they've deified science as the new god. And they want you to accept those notions because that makes you more easily controllable than... They just have to have an expert come out and tell you a thing and you'll panic and run out and put a face mask on and go get an experimental vaccine and all of that other stuff that goes with that. All in the name of the greater good. They don't want you to think. They just want you to accept what they tell you. The descriptions of things. And a technology like this not only would it be world-changing, make things better for mankind, but it would also open up the doors of space travel, allegedly. But what if there's nothing to travel to and you can't get out? They don't want you to find that out. What if that's the case? Like I said, I always reserve the right to be totally wrong about all of that, but what's the more frightening prospect here? Think about that, especially to scumbags who want to control everyone here and who think that they, they, they could become God in no uncertain terms and want to control and have power over everyone and everything here. Don't you think it would be a frightening slap in the face for them to realize, hey, uh, this isn't what we thought, that maybe we are answerable to a creator and that maybe... Maybe we need to build our own world here in which we could live forever. And I think that's largely the state of things, of what's gone on. To a certain extent, like I said, I reserve the right to be wrong on all of that. But it's food for thought. It's something to think about. What if that is the case? And what if that is probably the main reason they don't want to let this technology get out? Because if they do, and people can find ways to travel high up into the atmosphere and realize you can't go anywhere, <laughs> then that would absolutely affirm the existence of God. And they've done everything in their power in this day and age to try to defer people from that thought. It would be a huge blow to the power structure. I think that's why they keep these things hidden. But I'm pretty sure... Pretty sure these technologies have been developed, very much so. And this is just one of the proofs or evidences that point to that. And that's why it's important to cover this stuff. But anyway, folks, I want to thank you all for tuning in. I hope this was educational and informative for you. And I want to remind you I appreciate each and every one of you. We'll catch you next time here. Have a good night. Come with me.